Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases podcast with your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. EM Cases is part of SREMI, Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute, the nonprofit organization dedicated to improving EM care through research and education. The opinions expressed on this podcast are intended for information and education purposes only and should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any medical condition, nor should they be used as a substitute for medical advice from a qualified practicing physician. We see patients with headache in the ED like all the time. Thankfully, 98% of patients who present to the ED with a headache have a benign cause of their headache. Of the remaining 2%, 1% will be diagnosable on plain CT or LP, like subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis, for example. But the other 1% can't be ruled out on plain CT and LP very easily. This podcast is going to be about the life vision, or limb-threatening diagnoses requiring fairly urgent diagnosis and treatment that you really generally can't rule out on CT or LP. We all know the red flags for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Abrupt onset, unlike previous, maximal at onset, exertional, neck stiffness, etc. And we have very good decision tools to help us decide which patients to consider the diagnosis in and how to work up subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the topic's been done to death in EM, actually. And we also know the presentation of bacterial meningitis, right? Fever, altered mental status, headache, and stiff or rigid neck with jolt accentuation of the headache on exam. So we're not going to cover subarachnoid hemorrhage and meningitis in detail in this podcast. Those were covered in episode 13, part one, and episode 14, part one. Besides, those two diagnoses are almost always on our radar for headache patients in the ED anyways. What we are going to talk about are the big four or five causes of emergency headaches that do not routinely show up on plain CT or LP. I bet you could probably guess what those diagnoses are. Let's dig in and introduce our guests. Dr. Roy Baskin, neurologist at North York General, who you probably remember from our recent episodes on approach to general weakness and motor disorders. And he's the creator of the Cephalopod podcast, coming soon to wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, Dr. Baskin. Thanks, Anton. Uh, Really nice to be here again. (laughs) Right on. And new to EM cases, you've probably seen him before at the Emergency Medicine Update Conference, Dr. Amit Shah. He's both an academic and community EM doc in London, Ontario. He's an associate professor of EM. He has loads of clinical experience in all kinds of hospitals, from academic centers to rural and remote locations, and is the ED lead for the Southwest Lynn. So kind of the leader for emergency medicine in all of southwestern Ontario. He's also an amazing human just to chat with. Welcome, Dr. Shaw, to EM Cases. It's been a long time coming. Thanks, Anton. Pleasure to be here. All right. Uh, Let's dive in with our first case. A 40-year-old male car mechanic with a history of migraine headaches presents to your ED for the second time in two days with the same left-sided head and neck pain. On the first visit, he was diagnosed with migraine headache and given NSAIDs and metoclopramide, which helped his headache substantially. So what's the story with the headache? The pain came on while he was driving over a few minutes and has been waxing and waning since. He's never had a pain like this before. There's no exacerbating or leaving fa- there, there are no exacerbating or alleviating factors, although it seems to feel better with massaging the muscles around his neck. The reason he returned to the ED was that now he feels this vague tingling in the right arm that comes and goes. It lasts for a few minutes, and maybe he's got some tingling in the left leg and face as well. He's not really sure. There are no other focal neurologic symptoms, no fever, no constitutional symptoms, no history of trauma, and he does not take any regular medications. On exam, he looks well, vital signs are normal. GCS is 15, neck is supple, non-tender, there's no jolt accentuation, and his screening neurologic exam is normal. So let's just get your general thoughts on this case. Dr. Baskin, uh, you go first. What, what are your general thoughts when you, if you were an emergency doctor, seeing a case like this, second visit? Yeah, so I think one thing to point out here is sort of the 
kind of constant push and pull between head pain and neck pain. And I think one good thing just to keep in mind is they sort of go together like, oh, I don't know, peanut butter and jelly. Um, you know, the C2 dermatome includes the posterior structures in the cranium, like the meninges, the posterior vessels, and also the back of the head. So neck pain can be referred to the head and head pain can be referred to the neck. And so I think the first thing I would say, you know, he initially presented with, you said, left-sided head and neck pain. I think that's one thing just to keep in mind. If the patient complains of head or neck pain, I immediately sort of am thinking anything from the sort of clavicles upward. Great pearl. I love that. Okay. So if it's headache, it could be coming from the neck. If it's neck pain, it could be coming from the head. And if it's both, it could be coming from either. Yeah. I was trying to think of maybe an analogy in another organ system for emergency room docs, but all I know about is the head and neck. So I, you know, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say the chest and the belly. There you go. So Dr. Baskin, we're going to get into some more details about, you know, differential diagnosis and all that with this case. Uh, Dr. Shaw, what are your sort of initial thoughts? Anton, we're also in a constant push and pull between is this diagnosis serious or not? So really, that's the big question. We know 1% to 4% of the patients we see are going to complain of headaches, so it's a very common diagnosis. As you said in your intro, the majority of these people generally have something benign as a cause, and we don't want to be doing a whole lot of stuff to them if, if we're not going to get any yield. By the same token, some of these people have serious pathologies. So when you listen to this story, what things tell you that he could have serious pathology or should tweak your interest? So you talk about a few things that should should really raise some flags here that I better look into this a little more. Uh, number one, he had a fairly rapid, rapid onset of pain. We don't know if it reached its maximal, but it, it came on over a few minutes. So that's something we want to explore. Number two, a key statement in there was that he's never had pain like this before. So just because someone has a history of migraines doesn't make them protected against every neurological diagnosis known to man. So keep that in mind. And he then has a bounce back visit, which we have said repeatedly should raise flags for you. And lastly, he describes neurological symptoms on his history. Now, on the other hand, his neurological symptoms are just consisting of sensory symptoms, which we know are also, you know, accompanied by a whole variety of other non-serious pathology. But he does complain of neurological symptoms in association with a few other red flags. So we're going to be interested in this patient in exploring this a little further. This is not someone who we're going to just put to the side and say, this is benign immediately. Beautiful. Love it. Let's talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis. I like to ask residents, you know, what do you think is most likely to kill this patient? What do you think the most likely diagnosis is? So Dr. Baskin, what would be the most likely thing to kill this patient? Just with this presentation that we have, what do you think? Emergency doctors are very sensitized to the dangerous causes of headaches. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is, of course, the most dangerous. I think a cervical vessel dissection is rarely dangerous, but sounds bad and can cause stroke. So that's something that has to be kept in mind as a dangerous, but not necessarily a fatal diagnosis. One thing to keep in mind when you're diagnosing migraine, as this patient was with the first visit, is that you, you have to be very diligent in the way that you take the history if you're going to make a diagnosis of migraine. I have a little mnemonic that I use to remind myself about the things to ask and the way to approach the history that I think might be useful. Sure, yeah. Let's talk about then your sort of general approach to headaches and this mnemonic for what you want to try and pull out of the history. Go for it. I think similar to many symptoms faced by emergency room physicians, headache is problematic because it can be caused by such a wide variety of pathologies from benign to sublime to malignant. And as a constant friend of the emergency room physician, I, Anton, have developed a mnemonic specifically for your listeners. 
to keep in mind the various causes of head pain that might present to the emergency department, which will guarantee first that you never miss a dangerous diagnosis, second, that your headache patient leaves your department feeling reassured, and third, and most importantly, you leave your department reassured that you've taken good care of your headache patient. So if you don't mind, let me just directly address the listeners momentarily and ask you to write down on a piece of paper, I'm serious, you should pause this podcast and you should go and get a piece of paper and a pen and you should write this down. I'm serious, go and get a piece of paper and a pen. So, okay, you're back with your pen and paper. Now write down horizontally across the top of the page, M. Y space B R A I N space H U R T S as in my brain hurts. And if you really never want to forget this, you should Google the brain specialist skit by John Cleese from Monty Python. I should also add that this mnemonic is patented. Okay, so let's get started. So the M is for migraine. The vast majority of people who present to the emergency department have a benign cause of headache, and by far the most common benign headache is migraine. So the M is to remind you to take a good and thorough history about the possibility of migraine And that includes going to your computer and looking at your radiology packs or connecting Ontario if you're here in Ontario or some other um, portion of the medical record where you can go back many years and see how many times this person has had a CT scan or MRI of their head because of headache. I do this for pretty much every new headache patient that I see. And you would be amazed at how many people have had their head scanned for head pain and don't remember having it done. It establishes a really good baseline regarding headache frequency. It helps to frame the discussion you have with the patient if they've had previous scans before. And um, so I think that's a really, really important part of doing your background um, medical record check on a headache patient. The M for migraine also reminds you to ask appropriate questions about family history of migraine, headaches that come with period, with lack of sleep, with not eating, with stress. And one of the phrases to look for is when the patient tells you that they don't get migraines, but they get, quote, regular headaches or, quote, headaches like anyone else or quote, just usual headaches. Generally, we neurologists consider headaches to be not a normal state. And if a patient has periodic headaches that they consider normal or regular, that usually indicates that they probably have migraine and would make you mind the history more thoroughly. Remember that migraine is a lifelong disorder Migraines don't have to be big, grand, finale headaches that bring you to the emergency department with aura and vomiting and tingling and photophobia and phonophobia. They can be just head pain that's quite severe. Or they could be head pain that's not too severe because the patient always takes analgesia for them. You should mine the patient's history and also don't forget to visit their medicine cabinet. I like to ask patients, tell me what pain medications you have in your house. Advil, Tylenol, aspirin, Excedrin, Aleve, Naproxen. And why do you take them? Whose pills are those? I think this is uh, super helpful too because we're focusing the history that we've taken of the acute headache through the lens of this background history. And sometimes you're not able to get that background history because in Emerge, our ultimate question is, is this particular headache serious or different? And you can't make that 
decision unless you have an accurate history of what the background headache history is. So that's a great way of focusing. it. Okay. The why, and you should write this down, is for yes, but. So if you do establish for yourself that the patient has migraine, I think it's important, as Amit said, to remember that that doesn't exclude them from having another pathology. So the yes, but is to remind you to continue with the rest of the acronym brain hurts to make sure that there isn't a malignant cause in addition to migraine. Even if you're pretty sure it's a migraine, I think it's useful just to do a quick mental pass through the acronym and make sure that you're not missing anything. So the B is for bleed. This could be in the form of a subdural, epidural, subarachnoid, multi-compartment hemorrhage. And the B is also, and write this down, bumps and blood thinners. So obviously those would be risk factors for traumatic or blood thinner related bleeds and important to keep in mind. Okay, the R is for RCVS or reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. This is probably the most common cause of thunderclap headaches. It's a spasm of the arteries in the brain. It's similar to maybe Prince Metal Angina. And it's rare, but important to know about because it presents with a thunderclap headache and can mimic a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The A is for arteriopathy. So this is to prompt you to think about cervical artery dissections of the carotid or vertebrals. And I like that it's uh, separated out from other parts of the mnemonic as a separate entity because it's important to think about the problem as a vascular problem of the vessels and prompt you to think about what you need to image. Okay, but the artery can do more than just tear. We have to think about inflamed arteries. And so the A for arteriopathy also includes the vasculitides. Most importantly for a headache differential diagnosis would be giant cell arteritis, which is a vasculitis really of the cranial vessels. And probably less important for headache um, because it's much more rare, is a CNS vasculitis, either a primary autoimmune CNS vasculitis or VZV vasculitis, varicella zoster vasculopathy. Okay, the I is for IIH, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, also known as pseudotumor cerebri, if you're older than me, like around Anton's age, for example. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> and also don't forget that uh, the diagnosis that overlaps a bit with IIH that we'll discuss in the next episode is cerebral venous thrombosis. So the I is IIH slash CVT. The N is for neuralgias like trigeminal neuralgia and occipital neuralgia. Okay, we're on to the Hertz part of our My Brain Hertz acronym. The H is for Horton's headache. Who? Horton heard of who? Horton's headache, which is an old-fashioned term for cluster headache. And since there's no C in my brain hurts, we're going to remind everyone that cluster headache can also be called Horton's headache. Cluster headache is more common than most people appreciate. If you don't like that I'm calling it Horton's headache and you would prefer me to call it cluster headache, then the mnemonic would read, my brain curts, which makes no sense. So deal with it and uh, call it Horton's headache for this purpose. Okay, the U is for unusual causes of headaches. So these are some of the pretty common other primary headache disorders. And the U is there to remind you what sound the patient makes when they get the headache. So, for example, if it's a primary cough headache, <coughs> if it's a primary valsalva headache, uh, 
if it's a primary sex headache, ah, uh, or something along those lines. So U is for the common primary headache disorders that we don't typically think about, cough headache, Valsalva headache, and primary sex headache. Okay, the second R in our mnemonic here, H-U-R-T-S, is for press syndrome. So it's the R in press. Press is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which is incredibly poorly named because it's not necessarily posterior, not necessarily reversible, is more of a leukoencephalopathy than an encephalopathy, and uh, fine, the S is fine. Okay, the T in Hertz, T for toxidromes, like carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, you could also consider head pain caused by certain medications, like nitrates, medications that some people use for erectile dysfunction, which I, I don't, the names are not really that familiar to me because I don't use those medications, so I don't, I can't really remember the names right now, but some of those medications, they can also cause headaches. Inhaled nasal decongestants can cause head pain. And in patients with migraine, overuse of medications, analgesics, triptans, and over-counter the analgesics, especially mixed analgesics, can cause a transformed migraine, which is also a word that starts with a T and could also be considered a toxidrome. Okay, the last S, anyone want to guess? The last S is for my favorite cause of headache because um, it makes the emergency room physician look very um, silly. And the Monday morning quarterback, which is, you know, the specialist consultant look very smart, and that's shingles. The patient comes in with severe head pain, say in the V1 dermatome, just above and behind the eye. There's no rash. You put them on uh, some medication for something or other, like, you know, um, naproxen for migraine. You send them home, and then they develop a shingles rash a day or two later. So the last S is for shingles. All right, let's recap that whole mnemonic that uh, Dr. Baskin just beautifully lined out for us. M is for migraine and to mine that history because the more you can understand about the background history of their headache, the better you can discern whether the headache that they're presenting with is one of those acute scary headaches that we need to rule out. The Y is for yes, but um, for the same point. And then we're into brain. So the B is for bleeds. The R is for RCVS, which of course will make you think about subarachnoid hemorrhage. The A is for arteriopathies like dissections and giant cell arteritis. The I is for IIH slash CVT. The N is for neuralgias like trigeminal neuralgia or occipital neuralgia. The H is for Hortons, which is basically just cluster headaches. The U is for UGG, which are the other primary headaches that you get with cough, Valsalva, and with sex. And the R is for press. And the T is for toxidromes, like carbon monoxide, and also the various medications that can cause headache. And then finally, the S is for shingles. Now, I did mention at the top of the podcast that we weren't really going to be talking about meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage, but of course, meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage should I be in our differential diagnosis for headache all the time. This mnemonic is really to help you think about all those other causes. Dr. Baskin will be showing us how to do the quick motor exam that we chatted about in the last podcast at the upcoming online EM Cases Summit, November 11th to 13th. Now, if you're a regular listener to EM Cases and you've been listening for free, we are a foam resource after all, please consider supporting EM Cases by registering for the summit. Just a couple of hundred bucks will help ensure that EM Cases podcasts keep on trucking for free. <laughs>
Even if you can't make it November 11th to 13th, all the talks will be available for streaming for three months after the summit. Please go to emcasesummit.com to register. And for those podcasters out there listening, Podcast Camp is being offered online December 2nd, 9th, and 16th at podcastcamp.org. Now on to a very tricky diagnosis, cervical artery dissection. We talked a little bit how on our differential diagnosis is migraine, just because it's so common, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the other thing was a uh, neck dissection. So I do want to talk more about neck dissection. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about for the next half hour or so. So cervical artery dissection includes both vertebral artery dissection and carotid artery dissection. And if you're a full-time EM doc, you'll probably see one of these every few years. Dr. Shaw, let's talk a bit about the pathophysiology of neck dissections to help us understand the presentation a bit better. How do you end up with the deficits from a tear in your vertebral or carotid artery? How does that work? You get deficits from a couple of uh, uh, mechanisms with these uh, injuries. So keep in mind that there's two major neck vessels that, that commonly tear in the neck. There's your carotid artery and your vertebral artery. And when a tear occurs in that vessel, it occurs in the intimal lining. So the innermost layer of that blood vessel gets a tear in it. And that can happen spontaneously or it can happen through trauma. And when there's a tear in that lining, the blood starts to dig into the lining and tear further bits of it up and away. And once that happens, your clotting mechanisms are activated. So you start to develop local clot or thrombus at that area of the tear. And so once you have clot forming in this area, you actually have downstream effects of showering of small pieces of that clot or emboli directly into your cerebral circulation. So we're going to talk a little more in the podcast later about the pathophysiology of you know why this can be a difficult diagnosis or can fool us initially. But when we're talking about that, keep in mind that the mechanism is this local clot formation a thrombus that's formed, little bits of that thrombus are breaking off and going downstream. And it just happens that they're going downstream into the most complicated, important structure in your body, at least according to Roy, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to an aortic dissection, like a type A aortic dissection that can dissect into your coronaries and cause an MI and then it can dissect up your carotids and cause a stroke. It can, and it can shower into your legs and cause ischemia there as well and the kidneys. So it's a similar kind of idea, I suppose, except that this is all going to different parts of your brain. Yes. The showering of these emboli becomes even more important as a mechanism because in aortic dissection, you often have hemodynamic effects that affect people, whereas... Uh, these dissections generally present more with neurologic deficit or local pain. Those are the two key factors to keep in mind. You can also have local distension of the blood vessel through clot formation and tearing, and that can also cause some local effects, such as stretching local nerve fibers, which can cause Horner syndrome, and we'll talk a bit about that further on as well. All right, so a few mechanisms there. I want to try and tie those mechanisms into the presentation. So this patient, in our case, had fluctuating symptoms. You know, usually ischemic strokes are not fluctuating. They can be. Dr. Baskin, why are the symptoms of a neck dissection often fluctuating? If the patient's symptoms are fluctuating, it means that there's something active so if there's a thrombus sitting on a tear in the intima and it's shooting off emboli, you could have neurological symptoms that are coming and going, um, TIA type symptoms, transient ischemia. There can also be ischemia to an area of the brain, but the emboli slowly breaks up and there's reperfusion. And so the symptoms can come and go. But I think... Um, Perhaps more important than the fluctuating nature of the symptoms and very important to recognize in carotid or vertebral dissections is that our patient had unilateral head pain. So migraine is often unilateral, but it usually, by the time the patient comes to the emergency department, 
it's generalized. The pain's so severe, they're so nauseated, they're so photophobic. It, it's all one large, overwhelming pain. Um, they might say that it started behind one or the other eye or started on one side of the neck or the other. But with a dissection, the pain, which is referred from the blood vessel itself, remember the brain itself is insensate. It doesn't have any sensory organs in it. So the pain is coming from the vessel itself. So unilateral head pain is concerning. And one of the key things to keep in mind when a patient comes in with unilateral head pain is to ask yourself, is this from one of the blood vessels in the neck? And maybe it's better, instead of thinking about front and back carotid and vertebral, much better to sort of think about them left and right left carotid and vertebral, right carotid and vertebral, and that keeps you thinking, uh, keeping your focus on that part of the history. The other feature that our patient had was that it seemed like sort of this non-anatomical distribution of symptoms. You know, I had a bit of numbness here and a bit of numbness there. If he would have presented with a classic, you know, big vessel stroke, it would have been very obvious. Dr. Baskin, why do the symptoms of cervical artery dissection sometimes not seem to fit any anatomical distribution that makes sense? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. So let's just back up for one second and just let's first say that a lot of arterial dissections are asymptomatic. Then a lot of them present with just pain. Then some of them are going to present with pain and maybe a local symptom from the vessel tear as Amit alluded to, like a Horner syndrome that's coming from nerve fibers on the blood vessel itself. And then you can have a host of neurological symptoms that come from ischemia. So this is going to be a subset of vessel dissections that have cerebral ischemia. And then some of those are going to actually go ahead and have a stroke. And um, the reason that you may have symptoms that are hard to precisely localized is because of emboli, a shower of emboli. You know, if it's in the carotid in the neck, you, it could go to the MCA, the ACA. If it's in the vertebral, it could go anywhere in the brainstem or the posterior circulations on either side of the brain because the vertebral feeds into the basilar and then divides up into both posterior cerebral arteries. So because the neck vessels are proximal, there's a big target for the emboli to shower. The other thing about this patient that uh, made it a little bit confusing and vague were his sen sensory symptoms were kind of all over the place, you know, on one side, on the face, on the other side of the arm, you know, he had kind of bilateral symptoms. They were very vague. Is there something in the pathophysiology of cer uh, cervical artery dissections that can explain those sort of non-anatomical, you know, bilateral sensory symptoms? Well, if the dissection's in one of the carotids, you're going to get unilateral symptoms because you're feeding into the MCA or ACA artery on the ipsilateral side. And you're going to get sensory symptoms on the opposite side of the body. Um, if you have a vertebral artery dissection where the, the ultimately you're going into the basilar and then the brainstem, you, you could get bilateral symptoms. You can also get sensory symptoms, of course, with migraine as part of a migraine aura. I think, in general, this is um, tradecraft that I'm, I'm revealing here to perhaps non-neurologists, and I could lose my neurology license for this. Um, I think, in general, sensory symptoms are not great for helping to localize things because patients often have a hard time knowing exactly where a sensory symptom is. If they start to feel something, they're sort of... Uh, their amplifier goes up for detecting symptoms in other parts of the body. And so I wouldn't put a lot of stock in localization from a pure sensory symptom. I'd, you know, take it as a larger package here, taking those symptoms with a grain of salt. These are people who are going to have ischemia symptoms, like stroke symptoms, but with head pain, usually um, unilateral head pain. Uh, this is a cause of stroke in young people. So it's something to keep in mind for a young person with unilateral head pain and neurological symptoms. It's very important to keep in mind, as I said before, that a lot of people, most people who have cervical 
artery dissections do not have brain ischemia, so they're going to present with pain alone. Um, but otherwise, anything goes. You know, the ultimately these are what you're discussing here: neurological symptoms. These are strokes, so um, any part of the brain can be affected within the distribution of the artery. And then there are the local symptoms that occur, the cranial nerve symptoms. All right, so that gives us a little bit of a, a sense of how difficult these can be to diagnose, because really it can be any stroke sim- symptoms, it can be vague symptoms, it can be fluctuating symptoms, and they don't necessarily have to follow you know, a classic anatomic uh, distribution. So it's just important to keep in mind really that head and neck pain with any neurologic deficit uh, should raise a red flag. We mentioned at the top of the podcast that only about 1% of patients with headache who present to the ED will require more than a plain CT plus minus LP to diagnose their serious uh, cause of headache. Uh, Doing a CT angiogram of the head and neck on everyone with an unusual headache is going to cause a lot of harm to our system and our patients. So this is often a big question that comes up is, you know, to whether to pull the trigger on doing a CT angiogram. So Dr. Shaw, how do you decide which patients to do a CTA on? What's your sort of trigger or your indications? So let's talk about some general red flags for headaches that would make you think that I need to look into this further. And that may be a CT, LP, CT angio, or you have to consider some of the other diagnoses we're going to talk about later in these podcasts. But what are some red flags in general from the history that we should consider when we're examining a story in a patient for whether they need further workup? So I'm going to give you nine. Number one, focal neurological findings. So that sounds fairly straightforward. If they come in with hard motor findings, that's easy. But keep in mind in the context of our CT head and neck angio discussion regarding dissections, that these neurological findings can sometimes be transient, or they can sometimes be in a variety of anatomical distributions that may not immediately correspond to an exact stroke syndrome. So keep that in mind. Secondly, papilledema. So checking for that on physical examination is a useful tool. It's not 100% sensitive, but it will help reduce the probability of some of the diagnoses that are serious. Obviously, an abrupt, severe headache, exertional headache, neck stiffness and pain that is new in origin and doesn't have an obvious cause for it. Loss of vision, immunocompromised state, abnormal vital signs, and a bounce back visit to emerge. All of these things are part of the list of the big nine that you want to Keep in mind that this should make you examine the story and do a neurological examination that will give you better information to decide whether to pull a trigger on further investigation. And then, and then your question was, how do you know when to do a CT head and neck angio? So how common is a neck vessel dissection? It's definitely co- common enough that a full-time eMERGE doc will make this diagnosis a few times in their career. So you're going to see this. This is not just a textbook diagnosis. And we diagnose them more often now because we have better availability of CT head and neck angio. So keep in mind that we missed these cases even several years ago because there were a lot more barriers to CT head and neck angio. If you have a patient who has new neurological deficits and head and neck pain, you want to consider doing a CT head and neck angio. That's the, that's the first pearl. Secondly, if you have patients who have a history of trauma to their neck, that's something to consider. When you tear a vessel, one of the mechanisms is that you torque the vessel. So if you torque the vessel in the passage along the neck, that can cause it to kink, tear, and then create this tear in the clot that we're talking about. So that should prompt you to consider a CT head neck angio uh, as one of your investigations. Keep in mind that some studies actually show that up to two-thirds of patients who present with a neck vessel dissection can have stroke. So that's in some series. 20% of them can have TIA symptoms, and the majority of them have head or neck pain. So that should tell you that these patients, if you actually tease out the history, you're going to get some clues as to who's going to need further investigation. On physical exam, 
that Horner syndrome that Dr. Baskin mentioned, that can be present in up to 25% of people who are have a carotid artery dissection. And it's not something that we naturally look for immediately on exam, looking for that ptosis or the drooping of the lid and the meiosis. So that's worth uh, uh, taking a look at in the patients who you're thinking about this diagnosis and documenting if it's there or not. Cranial neuropathies, as Roy mentioned, that can make it a, a difficult diagnosis because those can sometimes be nerves that have subtle findings on exam or history and can make the story confusing. And keep in mind also that neck vessel dissections involving the vertebral artery can also involve dissections that travel down and involve the supply of the spinal cord. So you can actually have findings related to the spinal cord as well on a rare basis. Pulsatile tinnitus has been noted in a significant minority of patients who present with a neck vessel dissection, particularly the vertebral artery dissection. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So these kinds of clues are all uh, clues in the history and physical that we can specifically look for, presence or absence, that will help guide you in deciding whether you're going to pull the trigger. We've got a bunch of great red flags, so I'll just uh, review those. Dr. Shaw's red flags were focal neurologic findings, papilledema, abrupt severe headache, exertional headache, neck stiffness or pain, immunocompromised state, loss of vision, abnormal vital signs, and bounce back visit. Now Dr. Baskin's going to talk about the physical exam in general for a headache patient by going back to his My Brain Hurts mnemonic. So the examination for a headache patient can sort of follow along your mnemonic about the differential diagnosis, my brain hurts. You first observe the patient carefully for migrainous features of nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, avoidance of activity, wanting to be in a dark, quiet place. You carefully examine the eyes, including the fundi, here you'll see evidence of raised intracranial pressure. If you do a careful fundoscopic examination, that can uh, help you diagnose IIH, which is really the sine qua non of that disorder. Uh, you also look for meiosis and ptosis for Horner syndrome, which can accompany a carotid artery dissection. Important also to check the visual fields which can be affected in press syndrome and uh, sometimes intermittently abnormal in the migraine patient who's having a visual aura. Then I think a careful examination of the head looking for any temporal artery tenderness, loss of temporal artery pulses, any sign of shingles rash, any allodynia, which is non-painful stimuli that are painful, as in someone who has a neuralgia, especially an occipital neuralgia. You can look for any autonomic activation in the face, like conjunctival injection, tearing, nasal stuffiness. Those things would go along with uh, the Horton slash cluster headache. Then, of course, you want to examine the neck for meningismus. And then moving on down to, I think, a quick motor screening exam, as we've discussed in a previous podcast. The traditional neurologic examination is not as important for a patient presenting just with head pain, as opposed to someone presenting with focal neurological findings, or symptoms rather. So I think that quick exam I just described, plus a blood pressure, is probably adequate for most headache patients. Now for our advertising segment brought to you by Metricade, the amazing scheduling system. Metricade can actually predict what the average physician to time assessment will be any given day by looking at the physician lineup. You know, some of my colleagues see two patients an hour, some see three or four or five patients an hour. If your group wants, Metricade will build the schedule based on this information as well as what shifts everyone prefers to work, creating a lineup that can handle the inflow of patients hour by hour. Best of all, the schedule still feels like self-scheduling rather than a performance algorithm. I want to talk a little bit about some of the risk factors for neck dissections. 
Dr. Shaw, could you tell us a little bit about just the risk factors you might want to ask for in a patient that you're suspecting might have this diagnosis? Yeah, we we uh, see this diagnosis in young people and older people. So, uh, you know, the first thing to think about is that it is the most common cause of stroke in young people, a neck vessel dissection. So uh, age is not a risk factor per se, and you can't rule this diagnosis, diagnosis out in young people. So keep that in mind. Now, you'll have a higher risk of dissection, not surprisingly, in patients with a connective tissue disorder. So Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos, just like for aortic dissections, similarly, you can have a higher risk of tearing your vessel in your neck if you have these connective tissue disorders. So ask about that. We talked about trauma, and um, the trauma can be major or minor. So a typical major trauma would be people who've had a severe car accident and a flexion extension injury of their neck, those people would be considered to to have had a major trauma to their neck, and that can put you at risk of dissection. But even minor trauma, such as going on a roller coaster or, uh, you know, having your neck hyperflex suddenly for some other reason just from a standing height, these kinds of minor traumas, a minor blow to the neck, they are actually, in some studies, feel that 80% of cervical artery dissections are preceded by some kind of minor trauma. Now, of course, you suffer from the difficulty of not knowing whether that's the uh, causative uh, problem or whether it just happened, but certainly minor trauma can be a precipitant. Sure. Yeah, they say, you know, even if someone's shaving their face and their neck and turning their neck or they're turning around to check their blind spot, uh, this patient that I presented is a mechanic And you can imagine that a mechanic is extending their neck quite a lot when they get up under the car, when the car is lifted up. You know, it's difficult to pull these things out of the history because you can never be sure of, you know, many people check their blind spots. You don't really know if that was the inciting event or not. Uh, But certainly, you know, asking someone about what they do for a living and if it involves them cranking their neck around a lot, then uh, sure, that could be uh, considered the inciting event. All right, so that's a bit about trauma. Uh, Anything else in terms of sort of associated factors, risk factors? So migraine, unfortunately, is actually associated with a higher risk of dissection. Oh, great. (laughs) (laughs) It's the last thing that people want to hear. So far, we've heard that the neurologic deficits can be transient, they can be fluctuant, they don't have to follow any obvious anatomic thing. Now you're telling me that people with migraines are actually at a higher risk. Okay, this is a tough diagnosis. It is um, felt that people with migraines are at twice the observational risk of having a a dissection as compared to non-migraineurs. Now, once again, uh, uh, it's difficult to know how to place that in terms of cause and effect. I think Roy may have a comment on that as well. Yeah, I mean, generally you hear these things referred to as spontaneous cervical artery dissections because there's a tremendous amount of recall bias in all the traumas. Everyone uses their head and neck every day, you know, shaving, uh, looking up at changing a light bulb. Um, so our head and necks are moving all the time as we move through the world. So um, almost every patient will be able to recall some potential inciting cause. So I would not use that as a diagnosis if it's missing. And then a higher incidence in people of migraine, I think that also could definitely suffer from observational bias because of of course, migraine patients are much more likely to come to the emergency room, much more likely to get scanned, and you're much more likely to pick up dissections, many of which go undiagnosed. People have dissections that are asymptomatic or cause transient pain, and they're undiagnosed and later just found incidentally that there was evidence of a prior. So I think for an emergency room physician standing in an emergency department in the middle of the night, I wouldn't focus too much on the absence of any prior trauma. But I I mean, it's good to keep in mind and, and think about, but maybe not as useful, practically speaking, from a diagnostic point of view. I think you have exactly hit the nail on the head. So how do we take that information from studies and bring it home clinically? And I think the take-home pearls from that information, which initially sounds distressing and vague, and how are we going to use this clinically, is, first of all, trauma can be associated with 
these neck fossil dissections. So now if I'm thinking about it, if it's on my radar for, from some red flags in the history or the physical, then I ask the question, have you had any injuries to your neck recently? If that leads to something that may be specifically interesting, then I might file that away to increase my pretest likelihood. If it doesn't, I, I don't really ask people, have you been turning your head shaving or anything like that? Exactly as you said, Roy, that doesn't help me clinically. But I think asking the question of, do you recall any injuries to your neck recently, is a simple, quick question to ask. In terms of the migraines, I think what it tells us, this association with migraines, is simply that, once again, reiterating the point, don't call every headache a migraine until you've actually listened to the story. I love to hear that People say, this is exactly like my previous migraine, and I'm really looking forward to some Maxaran and Tordal, and uh, that's great. But if they have something that they say is a different headache than they've ever had, then I'm interested and I want to hear about it more. All right. Before we leave the, the trauma issue, chiropractic manipulation always seems to come up as a possible associated factor with neck dissections. But just like Dr. Baskin was saying, with uh, migraine, there's all this uh, association bias. What's your kind of bottom line with recent chiropractic neck manipulation as a risk factor for a dissection? Is this a myth? Is this the truth? I mean, I have residents come up to me and say, I've got someone with a headache and they just had neck manipulation from a chiropractor, so I want to rule out dissection. What do you do with that information? Anton, the, the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association looked into this in detail in 2014 and essentially published a position statement that said the incidence of uh, post-chiropractic neck ma manipulation associated dissection is probably low and causality is difficult to prove. And population-controlled studies have found an association of unclear etiology. And what that means in plain English is we don't know if people go to see the chiropractor because they're having pain in their neck from their dissection and then they show up in the eMERGE afterwards, or if some of these manipulations cause dissections. It's probably a very low-grade risk factor. It's Once again, it's worth asking about, um, it, but it, we're unclear on what the association is. And, and I think that uh, given this awareness, most chiropractors have gentle manipulation techniques that don't torque the neck the same degree as used to happen. So, There's also the important point that the timing of their trauma and then their onset of symptoms may be delayed. And then, of course, uh, if they do have any ischemic symptoms, those can be delayed anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours to a few days to a few weeks even. Before we leave the diagnosis of neck dissections, uh, I want to just dig in a little bit deeper on the visual or ocular symptoms that you might find with this. Uh, Dr. Shaw, could you just kind of review for us uh, what kind of uh, visual symptoms you might get with a neck dissection? So, uh, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is that transient monocular blindness or amaurosis fugax occurs in up to 10% of carotid artery dissections. You know, essentially some clot is moving upwards and is blocking that retinal artery. So uh, that's one thing to ask about on history. And we talked a little bit about migraines and association with, you know, with headache along with this diagnosis. And I think it's been mentioned many times, but keep in mind that migraines tend to have positive visual phenomena whereas neurological problems tend to have negative ones. You're losing vision, you're losing a portion of your vision, whereas with migraines, you tend to get the scintillating scotoma and the blurring of a portion of your visual field, which is very different. So that can help to differentiate it. But it's worth remembering to um, look at these um, visual deficits and uh, consider dissection as a potential cause. So if you have a migraine, as Amit said, you have a positive visual disturbance usually. You, you can have negative scotoma. It's going to be ipsilateral to any other neurological symptoms, say numbness or tingling, because you're getting spreading cortical depression from the migraine that starts in the occipital cortex and then moves forward into the sensory cortex. And all the patient's symptoms are going to be on the same side. They won't be able to see the opposite visual field. 
their tingling and numbness will be on the opposite side of their body. So you'll have ipsilateral visual and sensory symptoms. Wow, that's a great pearl. I never even thought of that before. So again, it's my, for migraines, they tend to have neurologic symptoms on the same side as their headache. Yeah, you can think about the migraine occurring in one hemisphere of the brain. That's why the, the pain's on one side from, say, vasodilation on that hemisphere, the sensory, visual, e- even dysphasic symptoms that you can get where, where you, you can't form language properly. So you're going to have ipsilateral symptoms. Now, let's say you have a carotid dissection that, as Amit pointed out, can cause amaurosis fujax or retinal ischemia. It's going to be contralateral to any neurological symptoms because you're going to be hitting your um, retina, say, on the right side, but your sensory symptoms or motor symptoms are going to be on the left side of the body. And then you got to remember that vertebral dissections can cause ischemia to the visual cortex, and that could be bilateral or unilateral depending on where emboli go. I think it's useful to think about the way that these visual symptoms would manifest to the patient. So when patients have visual field defects, as you probably know, they usually are not aware of it unless they bump into something or they're reading something. It's a subtle abnormality to the patient because the the brain doesn't know that it cannot see. The visual cortex has been infarcted and it doesn't know that it's not getting information from the retinas Whereas amaurosis fujax is a very startling symptom, sudden loss of vision from one eye. And similarly, a migranous aura, especially the first one, can be very disturbing to patients. And they may not notice it initially. They may say it started suddenly because they don't notice the small little scotoma gradually growing until suddenly they're not seeing one part of their visual field. Very interesting. So suffice to say that migraines tend to cause ipsilateral neurologic symptoms, carotid artery dissections tend to cause uh, contralateral symptoms. Uh, If they're vertebral artery dissections, then (laughs) anything's possible. They can be bilateral or contralateral. Fair. Great pearls. I think we've talked about just about everything that an emergency doctor would want to know about the history and physical and the workup of carotid and vertebral artery dissections. Let's move on to the management. So let's say we've nailed the diagnosis in our 40-year-old otherwise healthy car mechanic. The rationale for treatment is to prevent thrombus formation and avoid embolism. So in the ED, if you've got a really sick patient, you know, just like in a in a big intracerebral hemorrhage or an aortic dissection, you know, you want to make sure that the blood pressure isn't too high. So you want to be looking at the blood pressure, you want to manage glucose, all those usual sort of resuscitation things. But let's put that aside from now. Let's talk about the blood thinners that these patients should probably get. I understand that the data is very muddy when it comes to blood thinners to prevent further ischemia. Uh, There's also thrombolysis. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the evidence and in real practice, what do people do in terms of, do they get ASA? Do they get heparin? Do they get a DOAC? Do they get thrombolysis? How do you decide what these patients should be treated with? Sure. Um, I think I can make it very simple. So I think the first thing to say, Anton, we don't use the word muddy. We say there's clinical equipoise. Uh, <laughs> we don't know if antiplatelets or anticoagulants are better, and you'll see a wide variation in practice. I think the the one very important point is that if the dissection extends intracranially, so the dissection of the carotid starts in the neck, but the tear goes, you know, past the skull base and into the intracranial compartment, you, you want to avoid an anticoagulant for fear of uh, precipitating subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think in general, unless the patient has very active fluctuating symptoms that are going on before you, in other words, a high risk of stroke, you might be inclined to put them on an anticoagulant. 
as opposed to to an antiplatelet. I think in the emergency department, probably the safest and most efficacious thing to do is to give aspirin. And unless there's any bleeding on the scan or there's an intracranial dissection, you can't go wrong. You're going to the aspirin's going to um, have an analgesic effect. If you give it to a migraineur, you're not causing them any problems. So I think uh, starting with aspirin is probably the right thing to do. And then, uh, you know, the decision to use an anticoagulant can fall on the internal medicine consultant, the neurology consultant. I think if you're going to start an anticoagulant, you're going to be admitting that patient for further workup, uh, MRI, to see where there's been ischemia, et cetera. So my vote is for aspirin, unless there's a very specific clinical circumstance. Dr. Shaw, anything to add about the emergency department treatment of dissections? Well, this is a very challenging area because the evidence is so mixed. And we we don't have actually studies uh, available that have examined treatment of patients in the emergent setting with dissections to give us any good quality data on what can change their outcome within the first 12 hours or in the first initial period when we're caring for these patients. Uh, You know, we're talking now about the step where we've already ordered the CT head neck angio. Um, We have uh, uh, seen that there's no bleed because keep in mind, these patients generally present with headache and one of the things on the differential is a bleed. So you can't give them anticoagulants on spec in general. Um, So uh, we're... Uh, now in the mode of treatment. And as Roy said, you're really going to rely on your consultant here because given that there's clinical equipoise between these agents, and we don't really even know what the outcome is for people who don't get either of these. We know that if you do enough of these scans, we're now starting to do CT head and neck angios in lots of patients who are presenting with stroke symptoms. So now we're, we have a large body of these scans and you'll see that the radiologists will comment on old dissections or query old dissections. And it can be in a small number of cases, a challenging diagnosis to make radiologically with some, you know, debate over what the significance of some findings are when your radiologist reports this. So it, in essence, this is one of those diagnoses that you want to keep it on the radar you want to know enough to order the imaging in the patients who have the red flags. And then once we make the diagnosis, uh, you you are safe to give some aspirin once you have the diagnosis. And that's probably something that we would all do. And then you want to get on the phone to your consultant because you're going to get different answers from different people. It's also worth noting that the courts have been somewhat harsh at times in the past with the first treating physician, who's always the emergency physician, despite a lack of evidence, sometimes there's been some judgments against the initial physicians who didn't start treatment with something early once they've made the diagnosis or have um, uh, strongly suspected something. And it's surprising to see that because the evidence really isn't there uh, that people missed out on a good treatment, but that's how the courts have treated this, just because they tend to be young people with bad outcomes. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And th- that's why I think you can't go wrong with aspirin. I think um, by the time you've done either a CT head or CT angio, um, and you've either made the diagnosis of a dissection or you can't get a CT angiogram, but you know that there's no intracranial hemorrhage, you really can't go wrong by giving aspirin. Um, it's got an analgesic effect, and you're going to cover your bases for if there is a dissection that you're unable to diagnose because you're tech or your scanner are not available to you for an angiogram, you've treated the patient appropriately. And so you won't be faulted. So I think that's actually a pretty good strategy for emergency doc on the front line here. Yeah, that's a great point, especially for the rural areas, because let's keep in mind that a lot of the listeners will be in rural areas where you can't get a CT head neck angio and you have to decide whether to ship this patient out or not. And if you can get a plain CT head then at least you've ruled out the bleed and it's safe to give them some aspirin. Great point. That kind of brings up, you know, which patients need to be admitted to hospital. You had alluded, uh, Dr. Baskin, to the fact that if it's uh, an intracranial tear, that most of those patients will be admitted and then it gets tricky in terms of the treatment and those that, that those patients should definitely not be on uh, an anticoagulant. 
there's there's kind of a few different patients. One is, um, as Dr. Shaw was saying, if you're in a remote area, you can get a plain CT scan, but you have to send them out for, for more imaging. You'll get your plain CT scan. It doesn't show a bleed. You're safe to put them on aspirin, and they go. You don't have a diagnosis yet. Uh, then there's the diagnosis that you make in the emergency department with the CTA. Which of those patients should be admitted? Which of the patients are safe to send home? If symptoms are stable and you're just dealing with unilateral head pain, they're very low risk. You can give them aspirin and outpatient follow-up expeditiously, so stroke prevention clinic. I think if they have fluctuating or fixed neurological symptoms or the pain is brand new and you don't know what's going to happen, then they probably need to be uh, referred for admission. And the reason to admit them would be to facilitate an MRI, to look for ischemia, and to possibly consider anticoagulating them. All right, absolutely. So that that's great guidelines for a place where we work at a big community hospital. These suggestions of who can go home and who should be admitted are gonna vary widely depending on where you work and what your access is. Before we finish up with cervical dissections, the one question we have remaining is that about thrombolysis. I understand that this is not a, a common thing, but that there are a subset of patients with cervical artery dissection who might benefit from thrombolysis. Dr. Baskin, could you give us the lowdown on the evidence for thrombolysis and who you might consider it in? Sure. So I think, again, you know, the, the data are not great. There, there's not a lot of evidence I think here you're going to be dealing with patients who have a large thrombus, maybe a free-floating thrombus or a flapping in the wind thrombus, and you're going to be on the phone to your stroke specialist at a tertiary care center where they have you know people who can do endovascular treatment. This is not going to be like you would send someone for thrombolysis on an acute stroke protocol. You know when they work in, walk into your emergency department. I think this is something that's going to happen down the road after they've seen the internal medicine or neurology consultant. So I think it's something that's not really worthwhile considering unless you're working in a tertiary center where you have those a stroke team available to you. It's not a standard treatment for most people who have dissections. Okay. So I guess suffice to know that we should know that thrombolysis is indicated in some patients with dissection, that it's something that usually happens after the patient uh, is admitted. And failed the other treatments. And failed the other treatments. And all that being said, the evidence isn't very good for it. And so it's uh, really kind of a, a higher level team decision amongst the neurologists and the admitting team. All right, so let's review some of uh, the key take-home points from this part one of our two-part podcast on red flag headaches. First, up to 25% of strokes in young patients are caused by cervical artery dissections. Young people get strokes, and this is one of those things that you need to be thinking about when you have a patient that comes in with stroke symptoms. Cervical artery dissection can cause just pain with no ischemic symptoms at all. If there are ischemic symptoms, they can be transient, like a TIA. They can be fluctuating. They can seem to not fit any classic anatomical neurologic uh, distribution. And their neurologic exam may be completely normal in the emergency department. But it's still, you need to consider this diagnosis in those patients who have a good story of the head and or neck pain associated with a variety of different neurologic uh, symptoms. Remember, the eyes uh, are the key to the soul here. You really need to examine the eyes carefully in patients that you're considering this diagnosis and uh, look for things like uh, Horner syndrome. And in terms of management of these patients in the emergency department, there's no good evidence that doing anything versus doing nothing is actually going to change outcomes. The evidence is very muddy in terms of what the best medication for these people are. Uh, Dr. Baskin had mentioned that if it is intracranial, you want to avoid anticoagulants. And a safe thing to do is to consider giving patients aspirin when you haven't fully confirmed the diagnosis yet. That's a good tip, although we should be aware that really there's no good evidence 
that aspirin really will improve outcomes, but that's a safe bet to do that. Give aspirin if you're entertaining this diagnosis. And a script for aspirin until they see the neurologist and follow up with good advice on red flags of when to return. The kind of patients that can go home are the ones who have stable pain and have a normal neurologic exam, then they're probably safe to go home. The rest of the patients should probably be admitted. Um, Of course, that depends on where you work. Well, that about wraps it up for part one of our red flag headache series. In part two, we'll cover some difficult diagnoses to make in the ED that don't routinely show up on plain CT, cerebral venous thrombosis, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and giant cell arteritis. So until next time, I hope to see you at the virtual EM Cases Summit. Thank you.